only a sociopath feels no remorse. Only a sociopath feels no regret. But you don't want to hold on to it. The issue is to feel it, to learn from it, and then go about the job of being a better person now. Mm. And that's what happens in places where you were not humble. Go be humble now. In places where you were too self-referential, think more of other people now. In places where you were irresponsible with yourself or others, go be more responsible now. Mm -hmm. And so the atonement is everything. It's an acknowledgement uh, of where you got it wrong. We're back, baby, with a brand new season of the It's Fucking Spiritual podcast. Join us each week as we have unfiltered conversations about how to transform your life. Our mission is to usher in a new era of spirituality where you don't have to be all love and light to live a life of alignment. Here, we honor all of it, the profound and the profane, the magic and the messy, and all things that make you human. So let's discuss the truth behind transformation and be unapologetic in our evolution. From manifestation to money, embodiment to energy, and all taboo topics, nothing is going to be off limits. Are you ready to live a life that feels just as good as it looks? Let's get fucking spiritual. Welcome back to another episode of the It's Fucking Spiritual podcast. As you can see, we are in a completely different location because we are in the heart of Washington, D.C. Now, I've never actually traveled for an interview before, and I did today. And that is because the person that I am sitting with has had a deeply profound impact on not only my life, but the lives of millions of people across the world. And she doesn't really need an introduction, but for those of you who may not know her, to give you a little bit of background about her, she, for the last over four decades, has been a leader in spiritually progressive circles. And she has authored over 16 books, four of which have been number one New York Times bestsellers, including her mega bestseller, A Return to Love. She is the founder of Project Angel Food, that is a nonprofit organization that has fed over 18 million meals to those in Los Angeles who are ill and dying and homebound. She is also the co-founder of the Peace Alliance and has also helped create the U.S. Department of Peace. And she is also run for president in both 2020 and 2024. And she is known, known as one of Oprah's spiritual advisors. So just to name a few things. And, you know, all of her successes and her accolades aren't the true reason why I'm so excited to have her on the show today. It's actually because of the depth of her integrity and the way that she leads from her heart that is so palpable when she speaks. And I have no doubt the impact that this conversation will have on you and I deeply hope and wish that it offers you a shift of perspective in your own life that profoundly impacts you and those around you. So with that, Marianne Williamson, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. And thank you for your very generous introduction. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so honored and, and honestly humbled to have you here on the show today. And as I mentioned in the intro, not just because of all that you've created, but truly because of the way in which you've created it. Thank you. Yeah. And and I'm I've been so deeply impacted by who you be in the world. And I think it's so impactful that we have spiritual leaders who actually um, lead with their integrity and are so also open about their own humanity. And that's something that I so love about you and has just impacted me greatly is, is your honesty about the your life that you've lived and the path that you walked and, and reading your book, A Return to Love, and, and also The Mystic Jesus um, has just been yeah, really profound um, and had a great impact on my life. And that's kind of where I wanted to start today because um, I wanted to take us back to your story and I know you've mentioned in you know your 20s and 30s and all of the just kind of despair that you went through at this time. And, and what was the turning point in your life that caused you to pick up A Course in Miracles and decide this is the path that I'm going to walk? Well, my 20s weren't particularly unique. I think mm -hmm. it was a kind of garden variety drama and despair. Yeah. I, I don't think it was uh, 
any different than most people. I think the mm-hmm. 20s are hard. Yeah. And I, I don't think of the spiritual journey in terms of some spiritual eureka, some moment. I mean, we have these little epiphanies. We have these little moments of clarity. All of us do. But I think of the spiritual journey itself as simply living our lives. Yeah. Everybody's on a spiritual journey. Most people just don't consciously think of it that way. Mm-hmm. All of us are being put through experiences that are ultimately lessons in life, situations that offer us the opportunity to better our game, yeah. be better people, as well as challenge us mm-hmm. uh, to fall back into patterns of ego dysfunction. That's just what's going on in all of our lives. For me... I had been interested in anything having to do with the higher mind since I was in high school. So whether it was reading St. Teresa or reading about astrology, reading about tarot, reading about the I Ching, or reading about St. Augustine, uh, St. Thomas of Aquinas, uh, Heidegger, or um, Hegel, anything that had to do with a larger philosophical or spiritual or religious conversation was just something I was interested in. However, there was that, and then there was also this young woman in her 20s going through what people in their 20s go through, and there seemed to be very little connection because I had not, until I picked up the Course in Miracles, had the insight that I was looking for that would enable me to apply on a practical level these things that I already believed in. I already abstractly understood in many cases. Um, So when I started reading the Course... I believe there's one truth mm-hmm. spoken in many different ways, many different religions, many different uh, articulations of spiritual truth that are, are secular, that don't even use spiritual language overtly. But there was something about the Course in Miracles that, you know, and that's true for all of us. It was this particular book or this particular teaching, this particular whatever it was. It could be the Kabbalah. It could be um, Course in Miracles. It could be whatever. Um, all great religious systems have their mystical path, whether it's the Kabbalah in Judaism, Sufism in Islam. And in Christianity, there has always been, um, from the early days of Christendom, the Gnostic or mystical uh, uh, traditions. The Course in Miracles, because I'm Jewish, when I first saw the Course in Miracles, I saw it on, on a coffee table at somebody's party, And I opened it, and I saw a lot of fascinating things. But then I also noticed that it was uh, Christ-centered language. Now, I had studied Christian theology in college, and I was very open. It was very cool, but it was an academic setting. When I saw this book in my personal life and I saw that language, I went, well, you know, it's not for me. That's, you know, Christian stuff. A year later, I picked it up again. I was in a lot of pain. Uh, It was in front of me. I picked it up. And once you do, you see very quickly, this is not a religion. This is not the Christian religion or any other. There's no doctrine. There's no dogma. It's been referred to as a self-study program of spiritual psychotherapy. And people are students of the Course who come from all religions and no religion, it said. And that was where, for me, when you ask what was the moment, There was something about this book. Once again, this book doesn't claim to have any kind of monopoly on truth. It doesn't claim to be for everybody, nothing like that. But for me, there were these ahas that were very profound, namely that I couldn't find the peace of God without loving you, Hmm. that you couldn't. You know, I think a lot of us have had the experience where you feel like somebody's talking to you, but really looking around you. I'm not really looking at you. I'm, I'm, I'm busy. And sometimes that person, it says they're looking for God, yeah. right? I, I'm too busy to be with you, honey, because I'm on a spiritual path. <laughs> yeah. And what the Course in Miracles opened up, in my understanding, was the person in front of you is key, how you show up for them, how you think of them, mm-hmm. the notion that every single human encounter is part of that, what the Course would call highly individualized curriculum. Mm -hmm. And how do you do today? That that becomes your practice at the end of every night. How do you do? Any apologies you need to make? (laughs) Any any corrections? Any amends? Yeah. Uh, And where, even if you got it right, could you have possibly been better? Mm. And uh, if you weren't uh, your best, what threw you off? Uh, Where were you tempted? 
Is there anything in your lifestyle, anything in your thought patterns that you might want to tweak there? Mm. And that's what your life becomes about. And you realize that the more you practice, it's not a matter of should. The tone is just thought you might like to know. Your life will work better. If I'm kind to you, if I'm gracious to you, if I'm forgiving and, and I do what I can to create a space where you feel free to shine, you'll like me more. Yeah. You'll want to work with me more. The possibilities of things coming from our engagement will be much better than if I enter this encounter, negative, controlling, selfish, exploitative, or whatever. So it really... I don't think there's anything here that's not common sense. It's just that the world we live in is is not is is not common sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I'm hearing you say too is it's simple, but maybe not necessarily easy. Exactly. Yeah. And simple and simplistic are two different words. Um, it is simple. Uh, I think there's something in the course. You know, I think there's something in the course where he says something along the line of would I create a truth that a child could not understand? Mm. And yeah. sometimes little children are the ones who demonstrate the most. Mm. Yeah. The love that is our natural state mm -hmm. before we are trained by the thinking and the experiences of the world to yeah. fall into fear. Mm. Yeah, almost as if we're going back to what we originally know. Yeah, The Course yeah. in Miracles says that enlightenment is an unlearning, not a learning. I mean, I have a little grandbaby, and you see it in little children. They haven't learned to fear yet. They haven't learned that the world is a dangerous place yet. And that is, that is. do you have children? No. So that's the that's the challenge of parenthood or, or anything having to do with raising little ones today, to help them retain their innocence and at the same time have to learn certain rules, like, no, you don't walk off with that stranger, Yeah. you know? Um, creating systems that will enable us to love more easily. What do you think is the best way that we can do that, even for parents listening to this, if they're raising a child? I think parents have a natural, um, a natural knowing if they see parenthood as that practice. Many years ago, many years ago, long before I had a child myself, I had said something at, a, at one of my Course in Miracles lectures about having a mother's support group. And all these women said, yes, please, yes, please, yes, please. So all these women were coming over to my apartment. And I remember being very scared and saying a prayer. What do I know? I'm not a mother. What do I know? And I got in my meditation, your job isn't to tell the mothers how to be, but to remind the mothers that they have the knowledge of how to be. There is so much, not just physically, but emotionally and psychologically and hormonally, that is based on millions of years of evolution. Yeah. And if you listen to yourself, you know, when I was a kid, they used to use the expression, mother's intuition. You know, we've thrown a, a, away words like that. You know, they used to say all kinds of things that like now, hello, uh, mother's intuition, apple a day keeps the doctor away, take a walk for 10 minutes after you after you have dinner. You know, things that, oh, we, you know, and now science is saying, well, actually, um, verifying. <laughs> we've actually known all along what to do. Known all along. Yeah. And that's so true of many things involved in women's wisdom mm -hmm. and women's intuition. But I think that's true of fathers, too. I watch my daughter and her husband. They just love that little girl. And they, like, like the vast majority of parents, love mm -hmm. their children. And they are attentive and... Um, teaching her and kind. And I, I, I do think one of the best uh, pieces of advice I got um, that you can't spoil a child before the age of two. Mm. Yeah. I thought that was one of the best that I, pieces of advice. And what I does got. that mean to you? That until they're two, every cuddle they want, mm -hmm. every, every just, and then at two, you, you start being a little more, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. some rules, some... Yeah. yeah, and as we know about the subconscious mind and the way that it's forming and our attachment patterns and all of those things. Well, the very fact that in the first five years, 90% of 
uh, the brain develops. Mm. I mean, everything. And I think that's another thing that I, if, if someone were to ask me any reflection, perhaps not advice, but certainly reflection from my own experience as a mom, is every moment you can spend with your child before the age of five. Mm. Because whatever you get in there before the age of five is there forever. Yeah. After, once I go to school, your input is primary, but it's not everything anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but boy, anything you get in there before the age of five. If, mm. a, if a, a child, and I see this in my own life, I see this in my daughter, uh, if, if someone is truly cherished in early childhood, they're set up for all kinds of success. Mm. We, we all know the things that can set them up for dysfunction, yeah. parental relationships, and all of that. But we should also remember the things that set people up for success. Mm -hmm. And that issue of, of early childhood and complete cherishing and complete love and complete yeah. attention. Uh, and you're, in many ways, a human being is then ready to go. Mm. That's why when I ran for president, I wanted a Department of Children and Youth. Um, I, I talked about how we needed to front load our resources in the direction of children 10 years and younger. If we really want an America that is thriving 20 years from now, which is, and you'll be thriving 20 years from now, yeah. uh, we need to take better care of our children 10 years old and younger today. Mm. Yeah, that, that really hits me as well. It's just that's how we actually get to change this planet is if we change the, the, the way our children are raised. Mm -hmm. And I know you mentioned about un, the children won't have to unlearn all of the things, right? If we can keep that intact. And people are going to go through the human experience. Yeah. I mean, of course. And then that's part of the sort of heartbreaks of parenthood mm -hmm. that you get, the child will get to the point where you can't protect them from the lessons of life. Yeah. Um, but boy, if you're set up in childhood, there are so many ways to set people up for um, for success in early childhood. So that not so that you're protecting them from some of the lessons of life which are inevitable, but so that they're developing the attitudinal, psychological, emotional, as well as physical, obviously musculature to be able to handle yeah. life. You know, you know, the goal is not to create soft people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's. You want to be, it's, it's like in yoga, you want strong musculature and relaxed and soft within that. Yeah, makes complete sense. And do you think that parents need to, in order to create that, need to go through their own unlearning process in order to create that? Everybody has their own journey. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, obviously we all know about repeating patterns. Where did my parents get it right? Mm -hmm. Where my parents got it right? I want to extend that to my child where my parents get it wrong. I want to cut the cord. But you know what? I have to tell you, as much, you know, every generation has its own experience. Mm -hmm. And when I think, I came to realize that there were ways that I had criticized my mother. And then when I got to the point of my own daughter reaching maturity, recognizing the ways in which, if I was honest with myself, my mother did it better than I did. Mm. Wow. And what was that like to have that realization? Well, I don't think any anybody uh, has their child grow up and feels no regret. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of woulda, shoulda, couldas and, in childhood, and, and every parent learns it because you don't get to make that up. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. If you you and I could have a relationship and we had a problem and we meet up five years later, mm -hmm. it could be like we forgive each other, work it out and start where we left off. You can't do that. If you messed up when your child was five, it's you can't take it from there once they're mm -hmm. 12. Mm -hmm. So I think conscious parenting is a very serious topic for people for good reason. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It makes complete sense. And I imagine uh, something that would make sense to do, I guess, is just to practice forgiveness, right, of yourself or of, like, that. I know that that's such a big topic that you talk about in your books, and that's actually something that I wanted to talk about as well, is, like, the practice of forgiveness. So how do you end up forgiving either yourself from the past or in a relationship, and I'm kind of moving on from even the talking about parenting, but just in general, like, with forgiveness? Well, you know, it's interesting. It's an interesting sort of completion about that conversation about mm -hmm. parenthood because it's so important that we forgive our parents. Yeah. And I 
came to understand my parents didn't have books about conscious parenting sitting on the coffee table. Yeah. Those books didn't even exist yet. So that that's that. But whether it's your parents or anyone else, from a perspective of A Course in Miracles, forgiveness is everything. Mm -hmm. But forgiveness is not the old-fashioned way we think of the term. Uh, you, you, you were really a jerk, but I'm spiritual, so I will forgive you. Yeah. No, no, The Course in Miracles says that's actually further judgment. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness from A Course in Miracles perspective is a discernment between that which is real and that which is not. So if you uh, look at me in a way that I find hurtful or you say something to me in a way that triggers me or um, something about your behavior um, feels unloving to me, well, that's real within this three dimensions. Uh, we're all doing our best here. You might have made a mistake. Uh, so do I, etc. The Course in Miracles says, now when that happened, I'm a choice. I can either base my sense of what's really happening in this relationship on what you said, what you did, what this drama is, react to it, back and forth, attack, defense, or I can extend my perception beyond what my physical senses perceive, how you look, what you said, to what my heart knows to be true, which is that you're just like me and everyone else. Uh, the innocent you is in there. When you um, said or did whatever you did towards me that wasn't loving, in that moment, you fell asleep to who I am. You did not see who I really am. However, if I base my experience of you on that, I'm falling asleep to who you are mm -hmm. because you didn't get, I'm just an innocent person here trying to love and be loved. And when I judged you for what you said to me, I was forgetting not remembering that you are just an innocent person back there wanting to love and be loved. You know, that's why sometimes people will say, oh, don't be a Pollyanna. The response to that should be, thank you. I'm really working at it. I'm really <laughs> working at it. Why? Because Pollyanna is, I mean, look at the story. She goes into a situation where right, she'd been orphaned and her great aunt or something was a rich lady, uh, lived in a big house, but she was always in an ornery mood and she made Pollyanna live in the upstairs attic little call space or whatever. Pollyanna just loved her. Pollyanna just loved her. Pollyanna just walked all these people who weren't so nice and she just loved them all. The point is what happens at the end of the book. Everyone has transformed Mm. I think the old lady's, what, marrying the gardener person or something? I mean, everybody's transformed. The point was that she is a transformational figure. Mm. She's a miracle worker, Pollyanna. And, of course, the ego puts her down. Don't be a Pollyanna. If we were all Pollyannas, that doesn't mean you live in a state of denial. The Course in Miracles mm -hmm. talks about the difference between negative denial and positive denial. Negative denial is, oh, I'm just not. I'm just going to pretend this isn't happening. Positive denial is, I see it's happening, but I'm a choice how I choose to interpret what's happening. Mm -hmm. I can see that everything that's not love is a call for love. I can realize that there's something more going on here behind the surface than just this anger between us. Mm -hmm. I can know that love is the way out of this mess, not further negativity on my part. Mm -hmm. We're not always at choice what happens to us. There's no doubt about that. But the point is that we're a choice who we choose to be in the space of what happens. Yeah. And that's what forg a forgiving attitude is. And I, I, you know, I don't know anybody who makes it 24-7. I don't. But uh, the effort to make it 24-7 will make all the difference. Yeah. So profound. And I'm curious your take on forgiveness and discernment and boundaries because I think sometimes when people think oh I have to forgive that means I have to either let that person back in my life or right they end up foregoing their own boundaries what would you say around your advice for that the res the loving response is always the correct response but sometimes love says no mm. if a little child walks into the room carrying scissors no honey we don't we don't do that right so Sometimes setting boundaries is absolutely appropriate. But even then, you know, the way you started this conversation between us was by pointing out that you realize how important 
not only what we do is, but also how we do it. So the issue is how you set the boundary. And I've learned this the hard way. Uh, somebody would be upset with something I said, and I would say, well, what's, what's, I, everything I said was correct. Name one thing I said that was wrong. And they'd say, wasn't what you said, it was how you said it. Mm. So the issue of setting a boundary is you can set a boundary and still be kind and still be respectful, and you will pay a price if you're not. Mm. How so? Well, every thought, the Course in Miracles says every thought creates form on some level. There are situations where you can set a boundary in a way that because it's respectful, um, actually allows the other person to see that this is a win for them too, right? Uh, a woman was telling me the other day that her married son told her, Mom, you're in our, you're in our business too much. And it's becoming a problem in my marriage. And I really love you, but I really need you to back up. But she was able to hear it. And she said, you know, it was great for me. I needed to hear that. She said, and then she got really involved with this uh, international organization and so forth. But he could have delivered that news to her in a cruel way. Mm. Yeah. Right? It was an appropriate boundary. And she came to see that it was an appropriate boundary. But... There are other ways he could have delivered the news to her. Yeah. And it made all the difference that he did it. You know, I love you, Mom, but there's an appropriate mother-son relationship. And then there's the mother-son relationship where the mother thinks, you know, that, that marriage boundary is important. I feel it with my own daughter. Yeah. Yeah, it makes complete sense. What has been something that's been challenging for you in your own life to uh, unlearn? Run for president. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Has there yeah. been any patterns or any certain things like as you've gone throughout your life that you said, you know, as you're studying A Course in Miracles and being a student of this work that was really challenging for you that you feel you've overcome now? Well, I actually wasn't kidding. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like this mm -hmm. um, that I've experienced. Um, if I do not choose to try my best to practice what I preach, I have so many reasons to become what to go in a direction that I know would turn me into an angry, pathetic, bitter old woman. Mm. It's my choice. Yeah. And it's a process. I've seen things that are, um, you know, I, it, one of the things I'm working with is there are some things that I think the American people should know. However, until I'm completely emotionally clear of my own reactiveness to it, I'm not the messenger for those things. Mm -hmm. I'll ultimately have some things to say. I'm not quite there. I'm turning the corner. I think, listen, anybody who loses a political race has to go through an emotional healing. But mine was, uh, I really did interface with some deeply corrupt forces yeah. in this country. And... Uh, misogynistic forces and dark forces, actually. Yeah. But uh, right now it's about my doing, once again, the how. Mm -hmm. I, will not be in a, I will not be the vessel for the articulation of those things in a meaningful way until I myself am purified of my own uh, fear, anger, resentment, mm -hmm. sense of injustice, betrayal, blah, blah, blah. Beautiful. I deeply respect that. Mm -hmm. And... How are you working to release those? Listen, or... I've, I've, I've said it for years. Yeah. My life works pretty well when I practice what I preach. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know what I have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, if there is someone who you feel treated you wrong, mm -hmm. um, the Course in Miracles says, within this realm of illusion, yeah, that happened. Number one, what part did you play? How did you make it easy for them? Where were you irresponsible? Where were you, did you allow yourself to be vulnerable to it? Mm -hmm. uh, you always want to do that, number one. What was your part? What was your part? Did you lack boundaries, things like that? Could you No, that, I don't or? think it was boundaries. It was, um, the boundaries thing came in later. You know, it's interesting because if you're running for public office, particularly if you're running for president, any move you make, the press is going to report on. And so if you can't just say you don't belong in this situation because, ah, she can't work with anyone, right? 
But then why did you hire that person? That person, I, I don't want to go into, like I said, I'm not there yet to yeah. want to describe this. Sure. But uh, whatever it was, mm -hmm. you know, I'm reading a book right now that's really good um, called The Obstacle is the Way. Have you mm -hmm. heard of that Ryan book? Ryan Holiday? Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't he live in Austin? He does. Yeah. Well, if you see him, please tell him I'm a big fan and that this book and I've been telling all my friends about this book and we're all reading it and every people I know uh, dealing with various challenges. I've really been touting this book because on one hand, it aligns with A Course in Miracles principle that, as the Course says, you are 100 percent responsible for your own circumstances. And if you um, don't take 100% responsibility, then the price you pay, the high price you pay, is that you will not be able to change those circumstances. Mm. So I was already well-schooled and disciplined in knowing that you can't go around an obstacle, you have to go through it, you have to uh, move through that. I knew that. But this book has added a piece, which is there's a gift in this obstacle. Mm. There's a gift even here. So you say, what is my work? Uh, what did I learn? Mm -hmm. what, did I, what do I have to atone for? It's kind of like acupuncture. It hurts for a second when that needle goes in, but you need to. Where were you, stupid? Where did you make it? Uh, uh, if, if somebody called you, you know, diminished your career and the dignity of your career and what you've done with your life, well, how did you make it easy for them? Because you hadn't defined yourself in the public's mind first. All these things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's painful because you, it's, it's painful for a lot of reasons. And, and knowing that the person who um, hurt you, if you pray for their happiness and wish them happiness, mm. uh, you will move through this and this will be transmuted and alchemized. And if you hold on to the grievance, the Course in Miracles says you can have a grievance or you can have a miracle. You cannot have both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how confronting to our ego, like, I'm going to pray for their happiness when this person has wronged me. Well, the Course in Miracles says, do you prefer to be right or do you prefer to be happy? Mm. And also there's a line in the Course. It's an interesting quote from the Bible. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And that is interpreted as God saying, I'm going to handle this. will get balanced, mm -hmm. but not through you. In other words, they have their own karma. Yeah. But it's I can't be the instrument of delivering what I think they deserve or else I'm just accruing more of my own. Yeah. Wow. Beautiful. And you mentioned atonement. What is your definition? I know, and we're going to talk about your book as well, The Mystic Jesus, and you talk about atonement in the book. What is your definition of atonement? Well, I don't think there's so much my definition mm -hmm. versus someone else's definition. Um, there's just different ways it plays out. You go back to the moment in which you get it. Now, in which you get what you did. In Catholicism, uh, confession, you atone as you go along. Mm -hmm. In Judaism, there's one day of a year, Yom Kippur is coming up. It's a day of atonement. You spend the whole day and you're fasting. So it's like so deep. I did it. I get mm -hmm. that I did it. I mm -hmm. get that I did it. You have to own. Uh, in um, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous is a program of amends. Mm -hmm. You have to admit it. You have to get it. I did it. I did it. I did it. I get that I did it. And I atone for having done it. It's going back in your own heart to that moment and knowing in that moment. And it might have been that you hurt someone else. It might have been that you just hurt yourself. And it's self-hatred. Listen, the forgiving that we have to do in life, the older we are. Because the older you are, the more layers of experience mm -hmm. that I the wouldas and the shouldas and the couldas, particularly as we get older. Um, I, I made the wrong decision but I, because I did not allow, if you're seeing it in spiritual or religious terms, I didn't allow God to guide me. Mm -hmm. I can think of um, situations where two major, major mistakes I made uh, professionally in my life. One, number one, I, it wasn't that I didn't hear intuitionally what I was supposed to do, which was wait and do nothing. But number one, I wasn't disciplined in my own understanding of these things yet to know if something in you says wait, then wait. I don't care what publishers say. I don't care what the, your agents say. If you get in your gut, wait and do nothing. Wait and do nothing. More than that, though, I owed it to her. She had been so good to me professionally integrity would have demanded that until she speaks and says what she wants, I'm not doing anything. Mm. Big mistake. 
Another one also has to do with integrity. Uh, I was asked to do the forward of the power of now. Mm -hmm. And I said I'd do it. And uh, sort of never got around to it. They kept asking me. Well, it was a kind of big professional error on my part. It was a lack of integrity on my part. Mm. You know, so many times people are thinking um, uh, opportunities haven't come or have to attract opportunities. We're always attracting opportunities. Mm -hmm. The issue is how many of them were blown, how many of them. This is true of personal relationships. Uh, oh, I never meet a man. I never meet a woman. I never like, really, is that true? Or did you not blow certain opportunities? And how? Yeah. So atonement is going back, admitting it, and asking for a healing of the part of our mind and the part of our personality. Uh, you know, some people say when you realize you've made a mistake in life, some people would say, oh, don't feel bad. There are no mistakes. There are mistakes. Mm -hmm. There are. But there are no mistakes that cannot be, um, through the grace of God, turned into something even better. So only a sociopath feels no remorse. Only a sociopath feels no regret. But you don't want to hold on to it. The issue is to feel it, to learn from it, and then go about the job of being a better person now. Mm. And that's what happens in places where you were not humble. Go be humble now. In places where you were too self-referential, Think more of other people now. In places where you were irresponsible with yourself or others, go be more responsible now. Mm -hmm. And so the atonement is everything. It's an acknowledgement uh, of where you got it wrong. And then Buddha lived 500 years roughly before Jesus. So Buddha says action, reaction, action, reaction. I got it wrong. It's going to have a reaction. Uh, you know, every, every action has a reaction. But Jesus is 500 years later, and the message is, in a moment of grace, the karma will be burned. Mm. You atone, you make amends where that is appropriate, and uh, your life will now unfold, not only in it, you know, it's like a GPS. You took the wrong turn, but the GPS will automatically recalibrate your path, mm -hmm. but only if... If there's love, the Course in Miracles says you can have a grievance or a miracle. You can't have both. So you have to forgive yourself and others. And then in ways that you might not see now, good things will, will still happen. Mm. Yeah, that's a beautiful hope because I imagine people listening to this thinking of their regrets as well and imagining. Yeah. Yeah. I think and I, as we get older, I think that's such a big one because... It's, it's like it's, people say, like, oh, your baggage. Mm -hmm. It is like baggage. It, it weighs on us. It's heaviness. And uh, you put those regrets into the hands of God, and miracles do happen. Mm. When you say put them in the hands of God, I, and I love that idea, what does that look like practically for someone, say, whatever it is that they're going through relationally? Or, you know, sometimes people say, yeah. oh, let it go. But it's mm -hmm. like, where? Yeah, <laughs> where, used, how? used to say, yeah. let it go. I'm like, where? Like, where? Um, in The Course in Miracles, it says the altar to God is in your mind. When you give something up, that means to the higher mind. So if I place something on the altar... That means I'm placing my thoughts about the situation, that your thoughts about something are that which determine your experience. For that matter, the Course says you are a thought in the mind of God, and that one day you will realize this entire world is the thought you're having. But if I have a relationship that's in trouble, I, to say I place this relationship in the hands of God means all my thoughts, and if I have thoughts about this relationship, not all of them are perfectly aligned with love, probably. And I put them on the altar. That means my higher mind, may my higher consciousness, thoughts of forgiveness, thoughts of atonement, thoughts of awareness. And then that which you put on the altar is then altered. Yeah. But it's specific. It's work. It's real, the inner work. It's not just saying, oh, I give this to God. It's like saying, I am willing to see this differently. I am willing to love where I have not loved. You know, I was talking to a girlfriend this morning, and she's having trouble with her boyfriend. And he's great, and she's great. But you know what? He's human. Mm. And so is she. And the task in love is not to find that perfect person, 
but to realize there is no such thing. And that, in fact, the reason you're brought together is because you have complementary wounds. Mm. So it's interesting because I, I, I told her, I said, you've had, because she was giving, telling me about their phone call this morning. And my feedback was, I think you did really well. She really did express herself and said, you know, I'm not going to get everything right and, and blah, blah, blah. I said, I don't have a but, but I have an and. He was saying to you over and over and over, I feel like you don't listen to me. Now, she did say, well, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes, which was good, actually. Mm -hmm. But I think it would have also been good from a perspective of kind of nonviolent uh, communication to also say, I hear you. Yeah. That you that you need to be listened more. I told her, I said, read love languages. This guy clearly needs more verbal affirmation. Mm -hmm. So give it to him. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, and if he's a Leo, give it 10 times more. Right. <laughs> um, so uh, all of us are, it's all a lesson in how to love better. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And kind of brings us to your book that you just wrote, The Mystic Jesus. And I read this book cover to cover and it was profound for me. And especially being someone who I personally was raised atheist, which is so funny to now, obviously, I've come a long way considering <laughs> my podcast is it's fucking spiritual and I've, I've really built my own frame um, of my own spiritual understanding. However, I haven't gotten too deeply into different religious teachings because I personally had judgments around uh -huh. what I thought they were judging, which is so interesting, right? How we do that and how that uh -huh. happens. And reading this book and, and, and hearing your take on uh, the mind of Christ and of Jesus and how it is universal. And I imagine people listening to this who maybe have had you know, religious trauma themselves or who might hear Jesus and might immediately reject the idea. Um, I found this to be very um, approachable. And I loved how you brought this concept forth in a way that feels, uh, you know, void of any religious dogma, but that is just available to all of us. So I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, what the mystic Jesus uh, means to you by your definition. Well, first of all, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate uh, what you just said. Uh, and I'm happy that that was your experience of the book. So as I mentioned earlier, when I first picked up The Course in Miracles, I'm Jewish. So I was like, uh, no, you know, all I was ever taught by my mother was, they read that Bible, honey, and we read this one. Yeah. You know, I just wasn't <laughs> taught anything. And my mother once said to me, I always remember this. I have no idea where she got this, but I do remember my mother. I think this is the only thing she ever told me about Jesus. She said, I think he was polite. Mm. <laughs> First of all, I'm not so sure he was. Yeah. You read the Bible, but she had that. But it was, I think he was polite. Okay. Um, when I started reading the Course, because I, once you start reading it, it's very clear this is not a religion. It says this is not a religion. There is no doctrine. There is no dogma. Um, all religions and no religion. I had the naive belief Oh, wow, this is so cool, because I never read words. I never encountered salvation or resurrection or crucifixion mm -hmm. from a psychotherapeutic perspective. Mm -hmm. But I hadn't encountered them, period. Okay, so I assume, oh, this is so cool. I bet this is what my Christian friends sit around and talk about when I'm not there, and they're just not talking about it when I'm not there because they're trying to be polite. <laughs> So I saw Orton walking into like rooms of Christian friends. Okay, guys, let's talk about the crucifixion. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. what has happened to you? And I came to understand that for many people due to their Christian background, mm -hmm. there was, I just was learning things from, for the first time, I was learning concepts. They were having to unlearn old concepts around the same terms. Yeah. They had to dismantle a lot of ambivalence that I didn't have to mm -hmm. dismantle. So someone, let's say from an atheistic background, mm -hmm. you, these words aren't charged. They're just not in your, they're just not there. Yeah. Um, and that is really what The Course in Miracles is about. And that's what The Mystic Jesus is about all of these things seen through the filter of modern psychotherapeutic understanding. Remember when Jesus said, uh, my kingdom is not of this world. Freud would not be born for another 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. So the idea of the inner life, 
So religion has always spoken, and and this is true of Buddha, this is true of Moses. I wrote a book called Tears to Triumph, which does similar work with Moses, with the Old Testament, with Buddha. The the great spiritual stories are code, Mm. and they all have universal spiritual themes. So from the early days of Christendom, there is the ecclesiastic, the, the trajectory that would lead to what we think of today is the ecclesiastic Christian church, and it's brokered by the church and its dogma and its doctrine. A lot of people find their true religious and spiritual sustenance there. I respect that. That's not to be minimized. That's like billions of people on the planet. Mm-hmm. But there are others who have rejected a lot of the institutional religion, but then find that they threw away the baby with the bathwater. They didn't want to be completely separating or disconnecting from God, even perhaps from Jesus, from any of these figures. And there's a real spiritual resurgence, as you well know, on the planet today. Can I have the spiritual nugget? What is the spiritual truth? So the spiritual truth We were talking before about how all the great religious systems have the mystical path. Mm -hmm. The mystical path is just the path of the heart. And so there has always been the path of the Christian mystic. Uh, And so Christ, from A Course in Miracles perspective, which is really what the mystic Jesus, what the book is about, cannot be monopolized by any religion. Mm -hmm. Uh, The sky cannot be monopolized. It's a universal force of consciousness, which, by the way, has many names on the door. And Jesus, in the Course in Miracles, is one name. So it's not an exclusive Jesus. The path is exclusive in that only love will take you there. But Jesus is one conduit for that love so great that it creates a divine intercession from a thought system beyond our own. And that's a big deal. If you and I are, let's say, having a conversation, and I'm telling you about a problem I have with someone, you might say to me, Mary Ann, I love you, but you're bigger than this. Come on, this. And I say, thank you, Richard, thank you, you're right. This is, this is how silly of me, I need to just get over myself. Mm-hmm. But it might be one where the trigger is so deep, the wound is so great, what they did in earthly terms is so egregious mm-hmm. that it's not so simple. In fact, it might even be something where we need help. So, you would, you know, like you say to Jesus, um, I get that you see him as a totally innocent child of God. <laughs> uh, I'm impressed that you do, but like I don't. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> but I'm willing to see with your eyes. Mm. I'm willing to be able to extend my perception to see their innocence. I am willing. So then it's like he looks at the person, and he looks back at you, and he goes, I like Because he's completely, his mind is completely purified of any judgment Mm. because he sees only love. And then the idea is, the truth is, is the Course of Miracles would reveal it, that he has been authorized by God. He, having reached that level of actualization of the full divine potential within all of us, he says, I don't have anything you don't have. I just don't have anything else. Mm. He's gotten there. There's, there's, no, there's no perception that's not purified of anything but love. Then he has been authorized by God. Should we request it? Because if we don't request it, it's um, a violation of our free will. Mm. But should we request it? Once again, the Course says he's not the only way. Uh, but if you request it, uh, he has the power. He says, my mind joined with your mind can shine away the ego. He says, I can help bring you up in a place where it's just too hard for you to do for yourself. Mm-hmm. It's pretty big stuff. Yeah. Wow. Like the biggest. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow. You talk in the book about the crucifixion and the resurrection and as that translates to our own individual lives. And from my understanding, the crucifixion is the moment that we're brought to our knees. Mm-hmm. And 
then we go through what, and I would love to share with you what my takeaway is, and I would love to hear your thoughts or, or if there's anything um, different than what I, I took from it. But the, the crucifixion is the moment we're brought to our knees and then we're in the void, which my understanding is Jesus was the three days on the cross. Mm -hmm. And in the void, there must be a, a willingness Right to I'm I'm willing to see this differently, or I'm I'm willing to take responsibility. I'm willing to see my part. Mm -hmm. There must be a surrender uh -huh. and an atonement, mm -hmm. and then we enter the resurre resurrection, which is a miracle and a shift in perception. Was that how you would describe Absolutely, it? Absolutely, one hundred percent. I okay. want to add a couple of factors for yeah. while you're in the void or the tomb. Please, um, to honor your human experience, to allow yourself to cry. Mm -hmm to not try to in any way invalidate the fact that you're human and have to have that emotion. Mm -hmm. And the other factor is to really know that this too shall pass, mm. that every crucifixion is followed by a resurrection, and that faith is not blindness but vision, visionary. Um, and uh, the other thing I love about that is when the uh, women went to get the body, the angel said, he is not here, he is risen. Now, to me, what that means is when you are brought down to your knees and you go through all the things that you said that we've been talking about here, the you on the other side of that won't be the old you. Mm -hmm. You will have risen, which means you'll be at a higher level. It's like a molecular change within yourself. Mm -hmm. Your personality is going to be different. Your, your, your nervous system is going to be different. Mm -hmm. Your state of consciousness is going to be different. Uh, so I... You know, this idea, risen, yeah, risen above the part of you that used to be so reactive, risen above the part of you that used to be so negative, risen above the part of you that used to be so selfish. Once again, when you see these things in practical terms, mm -hmm. that we're not talking about something after you die where, you know, hell is what is the anxiety and depression and, and, and fear yeah. that our ego minds put us in all the time. And heaven is the awareness of oneness mm -hmm. that sets us free of all that. Yeah. Thank you for that distinction. And I'm glad you brought that up as well, because I think that when people sometimes hear like, I need to be love and I need to be light. And you hear that in the spiritual, right? Like kind of the new age spirituality. You also hear like, oh, I just need to be forgiving. And and that can lead way to spiritually bypassing. So I love that you brought up that point of and honor your humanness mm -hmm. and honor your feelings and being with it. And during that time, surround yourself with people who will mm -hmm. honor that. Be careful. Yeah who you kind of let into that sacred mm -hmm. space of tomb time. Yeah. Because you have to be very gentle with yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, unkind people, uh, people who don't quite respect the pain of that moment, mm -hmm. are best make that lunch date six months hence. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. And for anybody listening to this, and I love to always, whenever we're talking about concepts, to kind of bring this into the 3D reality for what they might be going through right now. Mm -hmm. And from my understanding is anybody that's in a moment of where they're being brought to their knees. And, and I've certainly had those moments multiple times in my life. And I think we're, we're often, and I'd, I'd love to hear your take on this too, like we're often going through cycles of death and rebirth, and then you're born anew and you're risen to that Absolutely. space. And then you go through another <laughs> cycle. You thought you had it together, huh? <laughs> Ooh, how's that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you thought you really had all this together, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought seven years ago my my first spiritual awakening was going to be the thing, and then now I'm on the path, and I and then I've just kind of realized now, okay, this is going to just continue, and I think this is right. the the life my soul has chosen um, in in this moment, and and I love the way that you've put it and the imagining of the the crucifixion and the resurrection that we all go through in our lives and anybody that is in that moment of pain or that moment of being brought to their knees honoring their feeling opening to surrender asking i kind of i can see this differently the willingness to take the responsibility and something i want to bring up that you wrote in your book that was profound for me so i've been on this path, as I just mentioned, for about seven years now, and I've had multiple cycles of death and rebirth in, in that time. And something that I noticed within my own self and also that I noticed within this space and the people that I speak to is that often we can go into a self-development or spiritual, like almost like psychodrama of, okay, I'm going to look at all the ways from my past in which I've been affected and my parents that did this. And like, right, we can get into this almost perpetual cycle of healing, 
And you said something in the book, which I have it marked down here, that I love this distinction. Yes, feel the feelings, how you just mentioned, without spiritually bypassing. However, you wrote in, it's the meaning of now, the chapter of the meaning of now in the Mystic Jesus, you said, obviously at times we need to process things from the past, but there is a difference between processing and spewing. There's a difference between honoring our pain and indulging in it. Spirit might need to process, but the ego wants to hold on too long. There's a discipline to knowing when enough has been said. And I loved this because I've realized in my own life that sometimes I can sit in the journaling of it and the what, the why of it and how it, all the reasons why I am the way I am. And to, to have you say that as the discipline of knowing when enough is enough and to just choose a different way. I'd love to hear you speak on that as well. Well, we're talking about that tomb time, the mm -hmm. void you were talking about, and it's that symbolic three days. It's the same as the symbolic 40 years that the Israelites, from the time they were enslaved by the Pharaoh to the time they enter the Promised Land. But it's that symbolic three days, not nine days, 40 mm -hmm. years, not 120 years. And, you know, there's that old line, get off the cross, we need the wood. Yeah. You can feel when people, and that's this is important because your friends will reflect it back to you. Mm -hmm. You can feel when someone's doing the work of honestly grieving and processing and transitioning versus someone who's milking it. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can feel it. Yeah. And you can feel from other people's reactions to you. Mm -hmm. Um when you are honestly going through it and you are trying to do the work, people who love you are there for it. Mm -hmm. When you start holding on too long, you'll notice it's, it's a little bit repellent. Yeah. And um, I love, you know, in my book, the other one, The Tears to Triumph that I mentioned, I, I started with a quote from Roca. Let me not squander the hour, the season of my pain, the season of the dark night of the soul. It's important. Uh, I was talking to Mary Morrissey, and she was telling me the night of the dark night of the soul, St. John's work, it's not if, it's when, and the things that happen to you and what you learn about yourself. But then if you hold on too long, you become part of what has become far too prevalent in our society, mm -hmm. which is... All we want to talk about is the wounding. Yeah. Uh, I, I have said at various times, um, we as women, as men, as whatever, on this, uh, in this society, we've become too, uh, it's too common. How are you? Are you okay? Mm. How's your trauma today? Yeah. Now, sometimes, and, and I resent a little bit, having just been through an experience that was actually traumatizing, mm. I'm sorry how much we've cheapened that word. Mm. Because we call everything a trauma now, yeah, right? And then sometimes there are serious traumas that people go through. Um, but at a, at a certain point, not every conversation has to be, how are you? Is it okay? As opposed to, what incredible thing are you doing now? And mm. how can I support you? Yeah, That's where we need to be right now. I'm sure you've had your pain in life. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned it here. I'm sure there would be uh, uh, situations where if we have lunch at some point, I will hear about some of those things. It'll be meaningful. But there's also something else. How's your podcast? Yeah. How's it going? <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing to grow? Yeah. Uh, what? Tell me the incredible mm. things that are happening. Can I support it? Yeah. And we have got to get into this. And this is a big, big deal right now. Mm -hmm. These are very serious times. Mm -hmm. And they must be, they can only, we can only rise collectively to the challenge of this moment in our history if we treat them from a very emotionally sober, intellectually sober, and serious place as grown-ups. This is not a time for women to be little girls. This is not a time for men to be little boys. And we have infantilized ourselves. And in some ways, the higher consciousness community has contributed to this. Mm -hmm. uh, are you yeah. serious? I mean, you, we have on one hand... The generation that does most to complain about our own childhood wounds does the less in a way, the least in a way mm -hmm. to be there for the children, the broken children in our midst. Mm. Mm. You know, at some point, you you part of individuation and and part of the whole forgiving your parents things. At a certain point, it doesn't matter where you got your shit. What matters is that it's yours now. Yeah. And 
I, I know enough in my own life experience, having been have spent years at this and therapy and all of that, at a certain point, knowing where I got it has not freed me. Knowing that it's my responsibility to change it is what's freed me. And it doesn't help to have friends around you always enabling you by making excuses. It helps to have friends who are compassionate, who understand, but also support you in the knowledge that you can get through this and you can be better, and that that friend is holding a space for your, uh, for your healing, for your um, greater strength and power and maturity. That's, I think, where we need to be, and, and which is a very real way of saying, time to get into the resurrection, because mm. that's what the resurrection is. The return yeah. to sanity, the return to our wholeness, the return to the person that we all are capable of being and that we were when we were little kids. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. What is your hope for this book? That it reach whoever would be touched by it, mm. whoever would find comfort there, whoever would find um, inspiration there. Mm -hmm. uh, every writer or speaker, and I'm sure this is true of you during your podcast, your hope is that something you say will be an aha for someone. Yeah. Because we heal in life one aha uh -huh at a time. Mm -hmm. One like, wow, like you're reading a book. That's, that's why you read a book. You're hoping something in it will go, right. That's the piece I didn't have. Wow, thanks. Mm -hmm. That's what we all hope for in reading a book. And that's what we all hope to provide for someone else in writing the book. So that's my hope. My hope is that anyone who would be served, anyone who would be made happier, mm -hmm. anyone who would feel like, wow, wow, that's interesting, or wow, or the, the next day something happens and they go, no, I'm going to choose the forgiveness. I'm going to, that, that if to whatever and whomever that person might be, that this book find them and that they find this book. That would be mm. my hope. Beautiful. What is your ultimate hope for humanity? A sustainable future, obviously. We are living at a time of profound, historic change. One world is falling apart in front of our eyes, and another world is struggling to be born. And I think we need to be death doulas mm. to the world that's falling apart so that this can be a wise and responsible and loving transition to a new time, and birth doulas to that which is is uh, struggling to be born. It's happening. It is happening. But we need to go more quickly. Mm. Um, hate and disintegration, the forces of chaos, hate, disintegration, some really serious damaging things, mm. seriously, da are moving quickly. Mm. Love, in a way, it's on the move, but very few among us mm. um, couldn't afford to step it up a little bit right now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I'm seeing my own life. Um, and that's how I see many people around me. We're positioned, but come on, keep going and step it up mm. and don't indulge laziness or complacency. We have to create a field of possibility. Um, for our country and for the world. I think I, I, I think it's good to remember the conversation that you and I are having, there are probably millions of people having what is essentially this conversation around the world. Yeah. Different language, different form, but we're all downloading yeah. The new possibility. And that gets back into the birth of Christ. It's a collective birth as well as an individual birth. Christ being that which is mothered by our humanity, fathered by a spirit that is not of this world. And what is born is that Christ, that new person. You go, wow. So that's my hope for humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, birth into our better selves. Yeah. Ourselves that are going, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. What are we going to, what are we doing to this planet? Yeah. What are we doing? Oh my God. What are we doing? And and when we get to that place, the way will be obvious mm. by which to achieve our hopes for a better world. Wow. Beautiful. 
And I think a beautiful place to end on that note. Thank you so much for having me. Marianne, thank you for being here. Thank I'm you. so honored and humbled to have had this conversation, to be connected with you now. And for everyone listening to this, go grab The Mystic Jesus. It was an incredible book cover to cover. And I have no doubt if you loved this conversation today that you're going to be massively impacted by this book as well. So the link is in the show notes and the link to all of Marianne's socials and everything is also in the show notes as well. And if you loved this episode, please share it with a friend or someone that needs to hear it so we can spread this message even farther. And with that, I love you and I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for listening to the It's Fucking Spiritual podcast. I am so glad that you're here. And if this episode resonated with you, I invite you to share this with a friend that you feel needs to hear it. And if you are really feeling the love and support for this show, this podcast thrives off of your listens and your reviews. So I would love if you could leave us an honest review. We would love to hear your feedback, your thoughts, your questions. And it helps us get this podcast in the hands of more people and would mean so much to me to receive your support. So thank you.